we are here uh, for this afternoon's session, which is Essential Eligibility Criteria, Protecting Your Program and Increasing Inclusivity with EEC and the ADA. Um, before we get started, we just have a couple of announcements. So uh, we'll run through that and then we'll get started. Um, I am Kylie Davis. I'm the Member Services Manager with Move United, formerly Disabled Sports USA. And today we'd like to thank Bob Woodruff Foundation for their longstanding commitment and support, which has allowed us to bring you this virtual opportunity this week. Um, for those of you who have missed any previous sessions, the recordings of those sessions and resources can be found on the conference web page. Uh, this will be the same URL that you used or got in your RSVP for this session. For those who are in need of closed captioning, please check out the recorded sessions via Move United's YouTube channel where this feature can be enabled. Before turning over the show to our speaker, I would like to go ahead and go over a few housekeeping items. Um, you'll notice that all attendees will be on mute for the duration of this session, that is to minimize outside noise and distraction. But we do welcome you to submit questions for our speaker through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will um, address some questions in the middle of the session and then hold the majority till the end. Also feel free to use your chat function to introduce yourselves. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Um, make sure that um, your chat uh, function is set to all panelists and attendees to ensure that the whole group can see your message. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the session over to Ben Tettelbaum, um, who will be our presenter today. Thank you, Kyleen. Um, welcome, everyone. Glad to be here. I should say I am in uh, still somewhat frigid Maine and was looking forward to being in sunny Colorado, but it's exciting to see everyone joining from across the country. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, now to start the presentation. And Kyleen, if you can just let me know that uh, you're able to see that now. Yep, looks good. Great. Um, let me say to folks, uh, particularly given the content of my presentation, if at any point uh, you are having difficulty understanding me, or if there's a way I can present something more clearly, whether it's my speaking or the content, please um, please let me know and I'll do my best to, uh, to accommodate. Um, so uh, I'll introduce myself uh, a little bit more detail in a second, but just to give you the background, this program is going to be on the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. I'm going to go over a brief background with that uh, and primarily spend the time discussing the essential eligibility criteria or EEC uh, under the ADA, why it's important and why it really can protect your program uh, and increase inclusivity, not just for a person with disabilities, but really for all of your participants. Welcome questions at any point. You can just put them in the chat function. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity midway through to ask questions specifically about the statutory background. Um, but then at the end, we'll circle back and try to get to uh, questions that you have. So please just keep them rolling as we're going along. Um, I'd love to get a sense uh, before we dig in of uh, roughly who is on the call. And so uh, in the chat feature, uh, if you run an organization or, or you're a program director or program manager of some sort, some sort, if you could just, um, if you're able to just type in a Y or yes for that, I'd love to get a, a sense of that. Great, and then um, if you deal directly with participants, uh, if you also just type a Y in or say yes, it'd be great to see. And then finally, if you, uh, if you know that you have, or if you uh, think that you have EEC, Central Eligibility Criteria, already with your organization written down and made publicly available, if you could share that as well, just say why or yes. All right, great. Well, I, I think this presentation for some will maybe be a good return to foundations. For some, it may be new material. But again, if anything's confusing, just feel free to, to chime in. And I'm going to do my best to remember to explain if there's uh, something on the slide. Most of it's uh, a little bit of text, but, but I will note uh, if you're able to see the slide, uh, there are two pictures of folks recreating in the backcountry. The middle picture is a goat eating a birthday cake. Uh, and you might ask Ben, why is there a goat eating a birthday cake? Because goats are adorable 
and they help to break up a PowerPoint presentation. So you may see goats appear during the presentation. Uh, so brief background, again, my name is Ben. My law partner is Chad Olcott. Um, so we co-direct Pinnacle Risk Strategies. Um, I worked in the outdoor recreation education space for over 20 years, everything from working with at-risk youth uh, to running my own guiding company um, to leading long expeditions for the National Outdoor Leadership School or NOLS. And I still teach emergency medical courses around the world for uh, NOLS Wilderness Medicine. Um, I'm also an attorney, obviously, and I used to practice environmental law for years. And then Chad and I started uh, this legal risk management practice for um, the outdoor industry, although we consult clients more broadly who um, also do activities in the outdoors. So goals of this session. Um, primarily, we're going to talk about Title III of the ADA. And Title III deals with probably all of you, any organization you're involved with or that you run. So something that could be considered a, a, a private company or a public accommodation. Importantly, not gonna be addressing what many people think of with the ADA, at least in the general public, architectural barriers and those types of uh, accommodations. Not also addressing Title I, which deals with employment, or Title II, which deals essentially with government. But the EEC we'll talk about and the background of the ADA cuts across all of those, um, all of those titles. Um, and, and the primary goal is to give you practical, hands-on tools to develop these EEC if you don't already have them for your program. And even if you do, uh, to be able to go back and review them uh, because they are a really critical piece for your organization, particularly given the content uh, of this conference. And, and I will note there is a picture of an adorable piglet and a baby goat. So there will be more animals other than baby goats in this presentation. Uh, as a lawyer, I have to give you this uh, disclaimer because lawyers uh, do have strong ethics we must abide by. Um, I'm an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. And so the information in this session is gonna be what we call general. It doesn't mean I won't give you specific details, but it means I won't give you specific legal advice pertinent to your organization. So pertinent to a fact pattern that you have a question about. Um, if you do have questions specific to something dealing with your organization, consult with your own legal counsel. Um, you can also, if you have questions throughout this presentation about, well, does this really apply to me? You can always ask something hypothetically, uh, and I can do my best to address that type of situation. So why do you need EEC? Why do we strongly encourage you to have them? Well, one reason, as I think all of you are probably aware, is that without EEC, uh, no matter how inclusive uh, you, you think you are being or you're trying to be, uh, biases and misperceptions creep in. And obviously that can be dangerous if you wanna have an inclusive program, which hopefully everyone does. Uh, and, and it can pose a legal risk. Um, most importantly, uh, it can really dissuade people from participating in your program. So EEC really do two things. They help you manage program risk and simultaneously, if you do them right, they increase your diversity and your inclusion in your programs. Um, the, the idea is they give you truly a, an objective, non-biased lens to view all program participants. They, they are not, as you'll see, specifically for persons with disabilities, they are for everyone and they have to apply equally to everyone. Um, to manage that risk, it helps you to understand your program. So even if you think you know everything you do, by going through the process of drafting or revising your EEC, you're going to understand what you do even better. And you're gonna understand what your participants' abilities are, what their essential abilities are, uh, and what those need to be to participate safely, to manage risk as much as possible. That's really the key. Uh, and importantly, you avoid disputes um, because as with any co legal contract or agreement that folks sign, the whole idea with EEC uh, is to exchange information in a transparent way with participants. It's not, you're not trying to hide things. You really wanna be transparent with this information. So having these essential criteria available and known to everyone in your organization, the participants, helps avoid disputes. It's just like people tend to dispute uh, a medical professional if they trust that person and that person communicates openly and honestly. And that's the idea with EEC. And so therefore it also increases diversity. Uh, your staff, they don't have to speculate 
and come up with any arbitrary reason. Uh, you don't have to come up with the EEC, but you're going to have them even if they're not written down. Uh, your staff will come up with and you will come up with what you think is essential to participation. So having them codified somewhere eliminates that speculation for you and for your participants. Um, and then you're able to understand what accommodations you can make for folks, um, what reasonable accommodations. You may run rock climbing trips or kayaking trips or play basketball. And you may think maybe you cater your climbing trips um, to partic folks with particular disabilities, and maybe folks who uh, can't otherwise walk or have trouble with mobility. But what about that participant who is hard of hearing or deaf uh, or can't see? Um, are you able to accommodate that person uh, or a variety of other people? And this allows you to see how to do that and welcome everyone. That's the idea. So your screen now has an adorable goat snuggling with an adorable sheep. And this is a time where Hopefully you'll remember that picture because there's going to be another cute picture later. But what I'd like you to do uh, is to pay attention to this very short exercise I'm going to ask of you. Uh, and if you can and want to participate, great. But please pay close attention to the words I say because I'm going to ask you about it a little bit later in the program. So here we go. So what I'd like you to do uh, is we, we sit or maybe you're, 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 you're doing something else that's kind of sedentary. I'd like you to stand and just stretch. I will do this myself just briefly, and you'll see that I am wearing my full outfit for you. So stand and stretch. And now I want you to think of a time you were not at full capacity, whatever that means for you. For example, I broke my arm at one point, right? So I wasn't at what I would consider my full capacity. Um, so whatever that is for you, think of that example, take a couple seconds to do so. And then my guess is that when you're thinking of that example, when you had a broken arm, right? Or let's say right now, if you're a person who is sighted, you probably don't consider yourself or wouldn't label yourself when you had a broken arm as a broken arm person, right? Or currently as a sighted person. So as I think we all know, uh, if an individual has a particular disability, uh, that doesn't necessarily frame, obviously, that whole person's life. And so the important part, reason I bring that up, the important part of the central eligibility criteria is that when you're framing these, communication is key, communicating in a positive and inclusive way with these criteria that we're gonna talk about that you have written down, right? Simple example that we all know, person with a disability versus a disabled person, of course. The focus is really on being safely inclusive rather than exclusive. The idea of these is not to figure out who can we not bring on our trips, or our programs, it's how can we safely include as many people as possible. Okay, so we'll circle back to that very brief exercise later, but let us do uh, an overview of the ADA. And this may be um, stuff that a bunch of you already know, may be new for some of you. So again, if you have questions about specific to the ADA, please let them come in, keep them coming, Kyleen can monitor those. Um, this was passed a while ago, 1990, large bipartisan margins in Congress. Uh, which in today's world, that might be amazing to imagine, uh, because this is a remarkable statute that just fits squarely within our best civil rights laws. Uh, very, very impressive. The purpose, and I'll just read it because it's interesting, is to provide a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Very broad, really impressive, pie in the sky mandate. And its purpose is including people with disabilities uh, in, in accommodations, in activities, with equal access. So again, seems like it's a pretty broad context. What is a disability, you might ask? Well, again, <clears throat> this idea of being broad, any physical or mental impairment that limits a major activity, life activity. Um, but that's, it, because it's so broad, uh, there's more to it. If you just have a record of impairment, an example would be, uh, someone who had a cancer diagnosis, uh, and now their cancer is in remission, and they fully recovered, right? So they're a cancer survival. Uh, that person uh, has a record of some impairment, even though they currently maybe aren't struggling with cancer. Um, or they're regarded as having an impairment. Going with the cancer analogy, let's say you did recover, and a program, uh, you call that program as a participant who's recovered from cancer, and that program believes because you had uh, that cancer diagnosis, you are unable to do certain activities, like you can't rock climb or you can't go on a hike. 
even though you are fully capable of doing so. So they regard you as having this impairment that you actually don't have. All of those are covered as a disability. And then a major life activity, as you can um, see from this, it's things like hearing, seeing, breathing, eating, speaking. Again, some would say broad. I might say more appropriately, they are very. it's very foundational. So the act is very foundational in addressing uh, what constitutes a disability, to try to cover as many people as possible. So you're subject to the ADA uh, if you're a private business organization, for the most part, right? That's a public accommodation. My guess is that most of the folks here, organizations you work with, companies you work with, would probably be covered. There are um, times when you may not be, um, and I'm happy to go into some of those details, but they tend to be the exceptions rather than the rule. If you're a state, local government organization, covered under different title. Uh, or if you need a permit from uh, the federal government to operate, let's say you run a backpacking trip uh, on federal lands and you got to get that permit to have a group there, well, then the ADA is going to cover you even if you weren't uh, already covered. So what do you have to do to comply? Uh, well, maybe seems simple. Don't discriminate. And, and given uh, this conference, my guess is, that uh, people don't want to do that. Uh, I mean, amazingly, as you probably know, and that's not always the case. Uh, even and, and so there are some places that that uh, intentionally will discriminate. So you can't do that. Um, now, my guess is again, you probably won't want to do that. It's not your intention. But even if it's not your intention to discriminate, you can't have a disparate impact on folks, right? So maybe you don't intend to discriminate against folks who are hard of hearing or deaf. But by the way you framed your program the way you frame your criteria, you're excluding those folks even though they could participate. That would be a disparate impact. Or maybe you allow folks to come on that trip, but you're unable to or you're unwilling to accommodate them in a reasonable fashion, right? Uh, for example, them having a service animal to be able to go on a hike. Um, you have to be able to do that for the most part, but there are exceptions I'll talk about in a moment. And when you accommodate folks, you gotta give equal access to your programs and equal uh, it really means equal. There are a few times when you could have a separate program potentially, but really this means you have to provide the same program as you would for anyone else. Again, it's pretty broad. And that means you might have to modify your policies, how you practice your procedures, and provide certain reasonable aids and services to folks. Uh, there are exceptions to the ADA requirements. Um, and one of them, the first, is, again, think this is all around safety. If there's a direct threat to anyone's safety, right? If having someone on your rafting trip would potentially risk all the lives of everyone else on that raft, uh, then that's a reason that you wouldn't have to accommodate. Um, if it would fundamentally alter your program, and that fundamentally alter, it generally refers to physical, logistical, or, or substantive alterations, right? It alters the essential thing that you do, right? So if you, uh, if you rock climb and folks could not rock climb if you accommodated someone, then that would fundamentally alter your program. You wouldn't have to accommodate that person. Or if there's an undue burden on your operation, and that generally refers to financial burden, right? And, and note that this burden applies really to the whole entity, the whole organization. So if it's just one part or one program that's affected, um, but you could bring in revenue from another program to allow that one to accommodate folks, uh, you'd have to do that for the most part. But if it's a huge financial undue burden, like you'd have to purchase a tremendous amount of adaptive equipment, and that's not what your program focuses on, um, then that may be an undue burden on your operation and an exception to the ADA. Okay, we uh, are back to a slide with a cute sheet, which is going to refer us to a, uh, a previous slide. But before we do that, that was our ADA overview. I love to pause for a second and um, and ask Kyleen if we have any questions specific to the ADA. Happy to answer them now. I, I should say I can't see them at the moment. So Kyleen, if you see any, if you would like to um, uh, pose them to me, I'm happy to answer. I'll give you a, uh, 20 or 30 seconds to see if those have come in. Any of those questions specific to the ADA? Sure. We actually have a couple coming through right now. Um, so I'll start with a question from Catherine who says, under regarded, regarded as having, we have seen an increase in children whose parents struggle with their behavior, but teachers and doctors agree with us as rec therapists that their behavior is learned, not the result of a disability. Who ultimately makes the call with uh, regarding as having? 
Um, if three spheres of professionals agree with the behavior is not the result of a disability, but the family insists that it is, are we discriminating? Thank you for that question. Um, a couple things before I forget um, is one I should say, um, if it's not a disability, right, then you're still able to be particular or remove someone from a program for, for example, for a behavioral reason. Uh, now, yes, there are certain behaviors as you're discussing that may or may not be a disability, but just because you have EEC, you still have the right to uphold your organization's policies and standards of conduct or code of conduct. But to get to your specific question around that, um, ultimately the organization, as I'll discuss, crafts the EEC and you decide um, how they're implemented. But you have a lot of resources. And I gave you, I think, uh, part of the handouts or PDFs is a resource sheet, one that uh, allows you to contact a local ADA center to ask questions like this. Now, they may not give you a specific uh, advice. Uh, they may ask you to consult an attorney about that separately, but they're very helpful. And you can pose that situation to them and they may give you some guidance. Ultimately, the decision rests with you. In the end, uh, I'll talk about a way to try to mitigate your risk, particularly through documentation of all the interactions with that family. Um, because ultimately, uh, if there is a dispute, um, it's not going to come up unless the family themselves bring some sort of legal action. Most likely, that's how it would arise. It's possible there'd be some governmental actor that would intervene, but it's very unlikely. So it's really rest, the decision rests with you as an organization. And if you have EEC posted, they're available and their participants are aware of them, that gives you a really strong footing um, to explain whether or not that person meets criteria, um, regardless, quite frankly, of that disability. And question specifically, do they have that disability or does it qualify as a disability? Um, again, it's ultimately your determination, uh, but if you're quite concerned, uh, either consulting with that AD, a, a local center that can give you advice or ultimately getting um, legal counsel to give you guidance on that pertinent to the ADA, that would be the safest bet. But I should say um, it tends to be rarer that there is litigation here so long as you're being transparent and communicating very effectively with those folks. But again, that's where documentation is going to be very important. And I think this next question from April sort of dovetails into that, um, but you may be able to expand more upon it. How do you handle the communicating, um, quote unquote, direct threat? Um, they're dealing with um, something around this currently as a participant that continues to harm staff and other participants. Um, they've made multiple accommodations, but are getting to a point where they need to claim direct threat. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, this is where documentation is critical. Um, that I'd have to know more specifics, but assuming that that is a direct threat and there's a direct threat to the safety of that individual staff, other participants, then so long as you, again, having those EEC in the first place is important, but so long as you've, as you've documented well what's occurring um, through a variety of measures, you have incident reporting forms, um, you've got clear channels of communication within your organization. That's going to be the best way to then remove that student and then clearly explain to the student or the student's family, legal guardians, et cetera, why that was the action that you took. So it's mostly around having that clear documentation and systems in place to address that issue. Uh, great. And the next question we have is related to um, exceptions and service animals. Um, so they said a question that often comes up for them are, is around service animals and Nordic skiing. Um, dogs and foot traffic in general are not allowed on groomed Nordic trails at many ski areas because they adversely affect the quality of the trail and therefore the experience for all. Would this be an example of an exemption when applied to service dogs? You know, that's a great question. Um, and I have to do some more research. My, my, my thought is, again, unless it meets one of those statutory exceptions, it's somehow fundamentally altering it, which it might with Nordic skiing. I think there's an argument to be made for that. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, as you probably know, uh, right now dogs uh, and miniature horses are the things uh, that uh, count as, as technically a service animal. Um, and, uh, and it's possible that that dog might disrupt it enough that that person, uh, that it would be fundamentally altering the operation. Um, but I think that would be a close call and I'd have to look into that. I can look into that certainly for you more after the presentation and get back with you. Um, the next question is from Alex and he asks about um, program costs. Um, does an adaptive ski program have to match prices to non-adaptive lessons at a ski resort? 
Um, for example, if a group lesson package is $69, does an adaptive program have to match that price per equal access? Yes, so the costs for, um, for any uh, reasonable accommodation uh, almost always has to be borne by the organization. Uh, and so any uh, a change in price structure, in other words, let's say uh, it might be less expensive for someone, which is an interesting question, but it's less expensive for someone um, where uh, they, you don't have to make an accommodation. And so the base price is priced for folks who need some sort of adaptive equipment and you could charge less for other folks. Uh, that might start to get into trouble because it looks like you're charging a premium um, even if it's the majority of your clients charging a premium for the folks who need that accommodation. So I, either way it works out, really the organization has to bear that cost. And the only way to get around that is if it's an undue burden financially on that organization. So having a differing, having a differing price structure, if I understand your question correctly, could pose some problems. All right, the next question comes from Rita, and she asks, how would this impact programs that serve only individuals with physical disabilities specifically as part of their mission or require qualifying conditions in order to participate? Is this considered discrimination for individuals with other disabilities, such as intellectual disabilities? Yeah, great question. So uh, again, it gets down to this, what's the, uh, what's the fundamental nature of your, of your program? Um, and so to give a converse example, uh, if, you're, if your goal is to um, uh, do rock climbing and people will uh, be able to uh, lead climb um, independently, maybe you're training folks as part of the um, uh, AMGA guide certification, you wouldn't have to uh, accommodate folks who were unable to do that type of training in order to meet the ADA. In other words, doing so would fundamentally alter your program in some capacity. And so um, likewise, it really gets down to that question, is it gonna fundamentally alter um, you know, what, what you're doing? Uh, and so can, and can you put the, where's that question? I'm looking here, right? Let me see, Kylie, can you put that question up again so I can see the specific of it? I'm gonna post it into chat. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. Um... Yeah, I think I've got it here. Um... Uh, let's see. Oh, thank you, Rita. Rita posted it right into the chat function. Okay. I actually can't see, it is the, I can't see in that chat function. Oh, Rita, here, here, I, I have it, yeah. Uh, let me just review the question. Right, so, uh, it depends. It really, it's approached. So the question being, is this considered if you're really catering to folks with particular disabilities and someone has a different type of disability? Uh, really, it's being approached as the same way as a program, say, who doesn't cater to folks with disabilities, right? So let's say I have a a rafting trip and I'm and it, and it's it's not for a particular group, but then someone who is blind wants to participate. Um, I have to go through this process of whether it's going to compromise safety, essentially. And if not, then and I can reasonably do it. I got to accommodate that person. Similarly, someone with a different type of disability, unless it's going to disrupt operations, for the most part, you'll need to find a way to accommodate. Uh, again, though, this is why working through your EEC, you're going to see, is their particular um, issue something that is going to, uh, th that they can't meet as far as an essential eligibility criteria? And if not, and as long as you're not framing your EEC to discriminate against that person or that group of people, then, then you're going to have to probably find a way to accommodate that individual. It's feasible. All right, Kylie, we, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to jump in and say, can we punt the rest of them perfect. to the end? Yep, just absolutely. The time? Okay, yep. great, great. Thank, uh, great questions, folks. Uh, so let's jump back to this slide here of this adorable sheep. Uh, and if you recall, a, a little while while ago, we had that exercise, and I said a few things, and you stretched, and you stood up, and you thought. So, so think about that, and, and you don't need to respond, but I want you to think about if there are any words that I said um, that maybe were less inclusive as they could have been. And so if you're thinking back to that, the first thing I said in that little exercise with that other cute picture uh, was I said to stand and stretch, right? So stand, that word implies, for the most part, 
uh, that someone has legs to be able to stand, right? I said, think. Well, think implies certain cognitive abilities in a certain way. You can argue about the semantics, um, but the question I have for you, is there a way that I could have adapted what I said to make that activity more inclusive? So I could have used a different word. Uh, I could have said, move in a way that's appropriate for you uh, and stretch in a way that accommodates you, right? Because standing, well, was that essential to what I wanted to accomplish, which was to break up the slide a little bit and have you stretch? No, it wasn't essential. And so even though it seems benign to say think or stand, and maybe it's appropriate for your program, uh, but the challenge and part of the fun, I think, of, of crafting good EEC is really looking at that language and saying, how can I make it as broad as possible? So it forces you to break down what it is your organization really does in terms of activities. So let's go to uh, essential eligibility criteria, EEC. Um, and so you're trying to answer this question, who can participate? And really, who can participate safely? And the answer is, obviously, those who meet your EEC. And why do we have these? Well, it reduces employee misperceptions and participant misperceptions. It gives you objective universal language. It trans creates transparency and importantly, a feedback system. We've had some good questions about, well, I've had a particular call from a particular client or customer. Um, you want that feedback or you should want that feedback. You don't wanna be in the dark about um, a disgruntled customer or client. Or participant. Right? You want to be able to hear that and having these EEC posted allows that person to see that requirement and then call you and, and ask you questions about it. And then it helps ensure that everyone participates more safely. This gets a little to that last question, which is these are not designed solely for what we'd consider or the statute would consider people with disabilities. Um, the EEC help ensure that all clients participate more safely. It really does. And they have to be crafted in that fashion. So uh, the purpose of them are really to establish specific functions you need to participate. And, and again, this lens is on risk management or safety. At the end of the day, your goals are, you figure out what works for the participant, what works for the program, right? Uh, and language is key. So transparent language, objective language, clear dialogue with your participants. And they have, I can't stress enough, they have to apply equally to everyone. You gotta keep that in mind when you are uh, crafting them. And I already said this, who drafts them? Well, you do, because uh, you know your program or your organization the best. You can have legal counsel review them. You can have a bunch of folks in your organization as you should review them. You can talk with an ADA center, but ultimately you're the one really who knows best how to craft the criteria for your program. There's a sheet, a handout that explains how to develop EEC, but I'm gonna walk you through some of it. There are more steps on that PDF handout, but let me walk through them now. Uh, so first what you do, is you write down all the activities your program conducts. Now, that's not just that, oh, we rock climb and we do whitewater rafting and we play basketball, right? When, when we draft participant agreements, release of liability forms, when we do more legal risk reviews for organizations, we have a, a comprehensive survey and, and that gets precisely at this question. What is it that your program does? So in other words, yes, we know you rock climb. Yes, we know you do whitewater rafting, but do you have group meals together? Do you use transportation in a vehicle? So you get in and out of vehicles. Uh, do you cook around a campfire? Do you do carving with knives? So it forces you to think about really everything that you do as an organization. That's your first task in developing these. And then you break down your program, your rock climbing, and your specific activities, cooking around a campfire, uh, into stages. For example, get in the vehicle to go to the climbing wall, approach the climbing wall, put on harness, right? So you break it down into as many discrete stages as you think you need to. And you think about what are the directions, the rules, and the etiquette, codes of conduct, people have to be able to follow as part of the activity or part of the program. And then you start to even get finer and break down the specific skills into really their essential function, right? And I have an example here of keeping with the climbing. So for top rope climbing, here would be a single criterion. Independently maintain one's position on a rock climbing wall while attempting to ascend the wall, right? If you can't do that, and your goal is for people to independently climb on their own, right? It's hard to be able to participate effectively in the program. And there's some key things in that sentence, key words that are used, and we'll come to those in a second with some examples. But let me break this down further with those other bullet points. So you're thinking about the basic 
physical, mental, emotional abilities needed to participate safely. Now, this is overall for your program, in other words, that etiquette question, and for specific activities. And when you're thinking about, well, what are the basic abilities? You're thinking about how strong do I need to be to lift myself up a wall or, or lift that oar on whitewater rafting? What are my capabilities in terms, say, of cognition? Um, and, and what skills do I have to be able to do? And then second, think about equipment involved. Rock climbing, very equipment, equipment intensive. Uh, think about, this would be an overall consideration, think about managing self-care and well-being. Uh, and then, oops, sorry, go back. Uh, and then also think about whether you could have a companion or adaptive equipment help. So in this example, I said independently maintain. Well, maybe you phrase that as independently or with uh, the assistance of a companion or adaptive equipment. So you go through this process and this is time intensive. It takes a while to do this well. Lastly, you've got to use, I keep saying this, inclusive non-exclusionary language. So here's a little example. Ascend or move up is better than walk. Walk may seem benign, but again, that implies, like stand, it implies uh, certain abilities that are probably not essential to what your program is doing. So here are two examples, and we're going to work through a couple of these. And I'd love for you to be able, maybe in your chat function, to, uh, to just weigh in uh, with what you think is uh, the more inclusive criterion. So this is for rock climbing. 1A, so we'll just call it A, is this. Each participant must be able to detect signals of warning when in rock fall environments. B, each participant must be able to hear signals of warning in rock fall environments. So just take a second, reflect on that. Which one do you think is more inclusive? In other words, a better crafted EEC. And if you wanna write uh, A or B in your chat function, you are welcome to do so. Yeah, so we'll see here. Uh, a certainly looks better. And it's because of those highlighted words. So the highlighted words I have are detect in the A and hear in B, right? Now, we, we would agree, I think, if you're rock climbing for safety, got to be able to know uh, if you're in an unsafe rock fall environment, right, as a climber. But do you have to be able to hear that, right? Hear implies uh, that someone has ears with the ability to hear in a particular way, right? No, people who are deaf climb all the time. But detect is much broader, right? And there are other ways of being able to detect that potential rock fall. So this is an example, again, of where language really matters. Even if you think you're being benign, those verbs are incredibly important. So here's another. Um, this is for hiking. So the first example, A, each participant must be capable of traveling in varied on and off trail wilderness terrain with a pack weighing or exceeding 40 pounds. B, each participant must be able to walk and scramble using hands and feet in varied on and off trail wilderness terrain, carrying on his back a pack weighing or exceeding 40 pounds. Gets at the same thing, but there's some differences. So again, think about that for a second. If you want to type in A or B, which one you think is more inclusive, a better EEC. So here we can see highlighted. Um, that first one certainly strikes me as being better. Um, particularly because I because <laughs> I wrote it, but each participant must be capable of traveling. Much broader gives people a variety of ways to hike, for example, and then just the simple um, word with a pack because you're going to have maybe a heavy pack with a pack weighing or exceeding 40 pounds because maybe that pack can be carried on someone's lap if they have adaptive equipment or a wheelchair. Whereas the second one, being able to walk and scramble using hands and feet, unless your program is named the hiking while walking and scrambling using hands and feet program, which would be odd, right? That doesn't have to be an essential criterion. Uh, and then carry the backpack, that sort of implies you're carrying it, ability to carry it with arms on your back, right? Make it broader with just with a pack. And then for, for the bonus point, I have highlighted his, right? Uh, and even if you're not thinking about persons with disabilities, you wanna be inclusive with your language. Uh, and so think about using gender neutral terms like carrying on their back if that were part of your criteria. Okay, let's do one more. So here's for a mountain biking trip. Example A, each participant must be able to pedal the bike uphill in a standing position while downshifting the gears. 
B, for the duration of each ride, each participant must be able to independently mount and dismount a bike, start, move, and stop a bike, and sit and balance on a moving bike. So which one, A or B, strikes you as more inclusive, a better EEC? So if we look here, I switched them up on you. I tricked you a little bit, tried to. Yeah, it looks like B is actually the better one. So I've highlighted A. Um, think about, again, what's essential to mountain biking, right? Probably if they're doing it on their own, maybe you could amend this B to include adaptive equipment or a companion, but being able to do those basic functions for safety on a mountain bike, as in B is important, mounting and dismounting, starting, moving, stopping, sitting and balancing. But the first example, A, being able to pedal the bike uphill in a standing position while downshifting the gears, probably not essential. That's more of a, um, an advanced skill. Maybe if your course is specifically for that audience, sure, you can include that as your EEC. But if you're generally trying to make your program of mountain biking open to all comers, B is a better way of being more inclusive. So here is a, a little broader example of how to work through these with just a single um, summer half day whitewater float trip in, in my beautiful state of Maine. So imagine this is what you're trying to accomplish. It's just one thing you do in your program. Uh, so the first thing, right, that you would try to do is think about, um, are there, is there any other inf information you would want other than knowing it's in the summer and it's a half day float trip in Maine? Now, I might argue, I'd wanna know, well, how far is it from my organization? So am I driving there, walking there? Are people meeting me at the put-in, right? There are a lot more details you'd wanna have and you need to have that before you start crafting. this. But this is your basic background. So then we first break them into stages, right? So stage one is kind of overall for this trip. And I think about crafting my essential criteria overall. So overall for a half day whitewater float trip, folks should be able to perceive and comprehend inherent risk of whitewater rafting. If they can't even do that, that's gonna pose a safety risk. And you can exclude folks who would pose that type of risk on your trip. Follow verbal and or visual instructions independently or with the assistance of a companion, right? If you can't do that independently or with assistance, that's gonna pose a safety risk. So those are two overall etiquette and direction features that you'd wanna include in your EEC. Probably there are a lot more overall for your program. Then we can move on to stage two, Again, I'm going through kind of chronologically, we got to get to the white water put in. So you have to be able to enter and exit a vehicle, either alone or with the assistance of a companion. Next, we're going to be putting on equipment. So you have to be able to wear all equipment. Don't necessarily have to be able to put it on yourself or wear it in a particular way, but you have to be able to wear all protective equipment that's required. Stage four is the actual trip, which is why there's a lot more here. So being able to tolerate water of a certain temperature, as I say here, and bright sunlight for four hours or more, to manage personal mobility independently or with assistance, to effectively communicate to staff and fellow students independently or with assistance. As we said earlier, enter and exit a raft this time independently or with assistance. Remain seated and balanced using adaptive equipment if necessary. Perform appropriate oar strokes in difficult whitewater. Get out from under the craft if it goes over or capsizes. Remain face up in the water with aid of a life jacket and make progress toward the shore. Didn't say swim, make progress toward the shoreline in the event the watercraft capsizes. So these again, all geared really towards safety, either the person safety or the group safety. But I'd ask there, if you take a look at these criteria, and I think there's one in there that you might take umbrage with and take a moment, see if you can figure out which one it is. So I'm gonna highlight it perform appropriate oar strokes in difficult white water, right? Again, that's thinking more like an advanced skill. Do I really need everyone to be able to do that? If it's a training for folks to be able to lead trips, sure. But if it is just this half day summer whitewater trip in Maine for participants, they probably don't need to have that level of skill. So we wanna get rid of that when it's not focused on safety, it's focused more on some sort of higher level performance. So that's an example of how we'd work through it for uh, just one trip. You do that for all of your trips. So let's look at these steps in detail. So first off, and a lot of you had good questions that'll be helped by this center. Contact an ADA Technical Assistance Center. Next, go through that process and it's on the PDF handout if you wanna use that after the program. 
or if you have them, use them to revise your EEC, you're going to write down your draft EEC. Run them by other people within your organization. Uh, if you have legal counsel, run it by a legal counsel or think about retaining someone. Um, and then go back, you're going to want to revise them, I'm, I'm positive. Once you feel like they're ready, post them on a website and all your marketing materials and include a non-discrimination statement. Um, and, and make sure that when you develop next health and medical forms, they align with your EEC. You, want, you don't want to have contradictory information within your organization publicly available. And importantly, train staff how to talk with prospective participants. What can they say? What can they not say? That's where ADA centers will be really helpful or legal counsel to tell you some of those answers, for example, around service animals, what you can ask and what you can't ask. So there's consistency in addressing the public. And then next, make sure they apply equally to everyone and do that with your intake calls, right? Uh, and determine if someone can participate in your program with or without these modifications. Does an exception apply? Right? Is there some threat to safety? Document all those interactions. Um, throughout the process, document what you find and incur and get a process in place for your staff to do it. And then get feedback for folks. As I'm sure many of you know who work with people with disabilities, or maybe yourself have, are considered a person with disability. Um, if your program has EEC and you talk with folks openly and transparently, that is, you're doing worlds better than a lot of the interactions folks have with private industry. Um, so you're already ahead of the game. And folks are typically, in our experience, appreciative of having that open dialogue. Um, so you shouldn't be afraid of posting these and making them available. In fact, it's doing a best practice to have that. You don't have to under the ADA again, but you really should. It's a best practice. So then evaluate the feedback and finally review it, revise it, revisit it, repeat it for simplicity, comprehension, and efficacy. So annually, at least, you want to review your EEC to make sure you're keeping up with your programs. I'm going to leave you with three action steps. First, Draft or review what you've got for EEC for your programs. Second, uh, even if you've got an EEC already, EEC already, review all your public facing presence, your website, your marketing materials, and ensure um, what you're putting out to people uh, aligns with your EEC, right? And conveys you don't discriminate based on disability. You wanna be inclusive. Um, and then design and integrate staff training to communicate appropriately with participants regarding disability accommodation requests, because that's where it starts to get tricky, is what can we afford and as an organization, and what are we required to do? You're, again, your mindset should be safely inclusive rather than trying to, excluding your staff should have that mindset as well. With that, uh, there, there's a goat bowing. I wanna thank you for, for joining us virtually, and uh, would love to have, we've got maybe a minute or two just for some other questions, and I'll defer to you, Kylene, on those. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, this has been a ton of super valuable information and we've been cleared to go over um, on our time by about 10 minutes, which is excellent because we've received a lot of wonderful questions. Um, so we will do our best to work through some of these, but um, if we aren't able to get to your question, we will share your questions with Ben. Um, so we may have some follow-up afterwards, but um, Great. so I will start with, um, there was a question, this is actually a very timely question, um, with um, recreational therapists who do direct hygiene care, um, the question is with everything going on, could someone with a disability be excluded from a program due to the lack of PPE slash available staff to help with that? Yeah, well, as you know, first I'd say uh, the, uh, the issue with coronavirus and COVID-19 is rapidly evolving as everyone knows. Uh, and there are wonderful resources uh, all over the place online. First place to go would be CDC, and then your state is going to have most likely specific guidance as it reopens for certain businesses. So that's your, your front line. And then there are a variety of other resources. Um, it is a, a confusing time because there's not a, um, a, a single answer for businesses. It's a bit all over the place in scattershot, but going to the guidance from CDC in your state is gonna be the best way initially to comply. To get specifically to your question, um, yes, most likely, um, given the threat of the pandemic, if there is a direct threat to the participant safety, other participant safety, or staff safety around PPE or an, an inability to comply with that, that's gonna pose that direct threat uh, and make an exception. Um, now, obviously, this is a bit of a novel situation, 
So um, the only way to figure out if one is right or wrong in that assessment is for the most part for it to be tested in court. Sadly, uh, litigation is already starting, not around this, particularly with ADA, but around various issues with coronavirus and people contracting it. And so something for you to think about as an organization is, what's the greater risk? In other words, I feel, you might say, I feel fairly confident this may pose a direct threat if, I, if, if there is this history as you discussed. Um, and if there's this history particularly dealing with uh, a risk of contracting COVID-19, uh, there's probably less of a risk in taking that safe approach to exclude documented well than if that person won a program, there's an incident or uh, the virus gets transmitted. So it's a bit of that a risk analysis to figure out what's really the safer move here. Again, if this is specific to your program, the best way is to do as much research as you can, obviously, and, and consulting with legal counsel, talking with those ADA centers about this because it is evolving and there's going to be more guidance that comes out. All right, and I think the next question is um, going to impact everybody. Uh, where should EEC be posted? So uh, as widely as possible, um, they should be readily accessible and as accessible as possible, certainly on your web, your web page, if you have a website, uh, if you have brochures, uh, you don't have to be on every brochure or little postcards, but they should be accessible if you primarily can uh, uh, convey information by hard copy or hard, hard copy materials. So anything that's public facing gives you an opportunity to display them or at least provide notice to folks that they're available and where they can find them. So any of those public facing materials, for the most part, usually organizations will have a, a, a readily available link on their web page. That's just a common way these days, whether it's on a, you know, through a, a, an application on the phone or through the computer access web page, have access for folks to be able to find them in those materials. Uh, there's no requirement, again, to have them or to push them in a particular place, but you want to make sure they're not hidden. You want them to be available and refer particip prospective participants to those EEC. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Katie who asks, um, in addition to EEC for specific sport programs, is it recommended to have EEC for the program in general? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but can you be a little more specific? What, what, what do you mean the, the program in general? Is there, I don't know if you can, if there's an ability I, to clarify, but. Yeah, Katie, um, if, you, if you could type into, I, if you're still on, if you could type into the chat box. But, but, I'll, um, but I, think, I think I get what you're saying, which is maybe you have a variety of activities you do or programs you do, um, uh, or, or maybe your program's a, a, different, um, a different nature of activities. Do you need to have something general or should you have something for your program generally? And the answer is yes. Um, it, it's a good practice. It's a good idea uh, to do so. Again, remember EEC apply not just to Title III, but they're available in Title I, which deals with employment. And, and EEC in the employment context well, well, that's essentially your, um, your, your duties and responsibilities as part of your job description that you give to employees and you post when you're trying to hire for a job. Uh, and so th they, they are quite broad and your ability to use this tool across all aspects of your organization is quite important. So yes, for just general operations, having EEC, again, for anyone who is going to be accommodated as the public, uh, it's a good practice to have those. All right, and we'll um, try to cover at least two more questions here. Uh, the next question I have is from Greg, and he says, part of the beauty of adaptive sports is the ongoing process of pushing the envelope of what we think is possible together with our participants. Does creating a strict EEC disempower staff to engage in this process? Are we assuming that every solution has already been discovered and that there is no more room for innovation? Great question, and, um, uh, and certainly my, <laughs> Forgive me if, if this got conveyed, but my intention was not to think that EEC should be strict. Um, it's that they should really force you to understand what you do. And so, as hopefully many programs do, and it sounds like as your program does, your, your, your goal is to continually be as inclusive and adaptive and pushing that, uh, that edge progressively as possible. That's great. And so your EEC should encompass that. Um, they, they by no means have to be strict, right? It's more that they need to be broad uh, and not uh, try to restrict people's ability to function in your program. But I think also what your question gets at is, if you're continually adapting, which is great, we'll continue to revise your EEC so you make sure you're not inadvertently 
excluding folks who you don't want to exclude. Again, it's not that you would intentionally be discriminating, but you don't want to restrict yourself based on those EEC. Again, those EEC, they want to be written with the idea of inclusivity, just making people aware of what they have to be able to do to participate safely. So I'd say you can absolutely tailor those to make sure they're adapting to the progressive nature of your program. Excellent. And I think we have time to fit in one more question. This one comes from Michaela and she says, when an aid or parent has to accompany a participant in an activity in order for a participant to safely participate, would you establish an EEC for the parent or aid to safely be involved? Great question. Yeah, anyone who's going to be part of your program needs to be able to participate safely. That's, that's the way of looking at it, right? Now, there are a lot of other questions and answers embedded within your great question, uh, such as, was well, that parent signing a release of liability form? Um, are they paying to be on the trip, right? Uh, or, or any sort of assistant paying to be on the trip at, at, in, at some level. There, so there are other risk management questions that arise with that, but specific to this, yeah, they need to be able to also function in a way that doesn't endanger people. And that's totally within your right to request that or require that of someone, right? So if there's a very disruptive assistant or a parent who's going to be disruptive. Maybe there's some history or there was a question, you know, or any history of violence or behavioral issues, right? And they can't participate or assist their per the child participant or their co-participant safely, then you have every right to try to accommodate in a different way um, or not allow that person to participate in the trip as an assistant. Excellent. Um, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Ben, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic presentation. Um, as I said, we will share all of your questions with Ben afterwards. So if you didn't hear your answer, um, we will try to follow up. Um, we hope you had a, an excellent session. Um, we have shared a link to our feedback survey in the chat box. You will also be redirected to that URL when you close out of Zoom. So please um, take a second to, to provide some feedback on the session and also stay involved in the conversation for the remainder of the week um, on social, talk about things that you liked, things you're taking away from the session and hashtag move united um, to keep that conversation going. Um, so with that, we'll close out. Thank you again, Ben. Thank all the attendees and um, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.